Hello again, I'm Jim Lampley, and welcome to this month's edition of the Fight Game Overtime. What is boxing's cruiserweight division? First identified as such in the late 1970s, the space beyond the light heavyweight limit of 175 became an untenable gap as 201-pound heavyweights like Joe Lewis gradually evolved into 245-pound heavyweights like Riddick Bowe and Lennox Lewis. Faced with the reality that fighters who weighed under 200 pounds were disenfranchised against much larger opponents, governing bodies gradually developed a new neighborhood for them. But for the longest time, that neighborhood was inherently anonymous, and so too, with a few rare exceptions, were its residents. At this moment, cruiserweights are enjoying their highest profile year ever, thanks to an international tournament that has brought a handful of them together with the aim of crowning and recognized unified champion. One of the fights in that competition, the February 3, 12th round knockout of Cuba's Unie Dortikos by Russia's Murat Gassiev, is a strong candidate at this moment for fight of the year. But this month has brought the 15th anniversary of HBO's most cherished cruiserweight fight ever. The unforgettable battle between American former middleweight champion James Tony and Kazakhstan's former Olympic light heavyweight gold medalist, Vasily Jirov. It's the kind of historic marker that boxing sophisticates guard and polish for themselves, knowing they will seldom, if ever, see more thrilling human combat. So let's go back to April 26, 2003, at the Foxwoods Casino in Connecticut, for one of the very best fights you may never have seen. This is going to be the main event, the biggest event in the history of the cruiserweight division. Touch him up. James, touch the man's glove. Thank you. James is coming in with an attitude already. Tony fighting hard off the ropes, and Giroff bangs him back into them. Giroff comes in and fights the first two rounds at a blistering pace. Hard punches by Giroff there. to take one as he keeps throwing to the body. Oh, what a display of counter shots by James Tony. I'm not sure how much more Giroff can let his hands go in this situation. Hey, listen, hey, look, 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 you gotta keep beating on this guy, man. He's running out of gas, you know what I'm saying? Giroff just never tires of that. Never, never tires. Right hand by Tony, wobbled Giroff. Giroff takes three more shots in a row. Tony's big opportunity right here. Yes, it is. Big left tuck by Tony, and the right hand, and the bell saves Giroff as he wobbles against the rope. Listen, all right? Championship of the world right here, this round, okay? You gotta put this guy on his ass. I'm serious now, okay? <laughs> Look at this. Oh, oh my God. God. He got him with the left hook. Giroff is hurt. Badly hurt. Oh, my God. Look at this. resurrected his career with a magnificent performance against Vasily Jira. And now we bring you back to the set where we're joined by the Fight Games' new voice, Kella Fasana of The New Yorker. Kella, James Tony was a, an American boxing archetype in the sense that he was the product of a Midwestern River City ghetto. That was Ezard Charles. That was the Spinks Brothers. That was Floyd Mayweather. What was important about James Tony? Well, James Tony, when you asked him in interviews, he was always really quick to give credit to his trainer, Bill Miller, whom he called Pops. And Bill Miller was a link to an earlier era of boxing, really an earlier era of American history. I mean, this guy was born in 1925, collected old jazz records, and so a different world from Tony's world. And Tony liked to tell a story about um, Bill Miller giving him tapes of great boxers and sending James Tony home to go and watch them. And the thing that Tony picked up from that was this idea of slipping and punching at the same time. And, and Tony says it took him years in the gym while he was a teenager to get good at this technique and that he took a lot of punches while he was learning how to do it. But once he learned how to do it, he created this, this kind of optical illusion, right? Where he's there, he's right there. And when you see him coming to the ring, he looks like a really solid, mean guy. You're like, this guy's about to kick some ass. But then he's in the ring 
and he's there and he's not there. And you see Vasily Jirov in this fight. Jirov's got these long arms and he has trouble finding Tony because something about Tony, he can stay in the pocket, he can punch, but he slips just enough that the punches miss him by just enough. And it's an amazing style to watch. Yeah, we saw Freddie Roach training Tony there. That was relatively early in Freddie's evolution right. as a trainer. Probably there was really a cross-pollination of instruction going on right. between Tony and Freddie Roach at that time. Right, yeah, and, and Roach being known for a more offensive style. I mean, in retrospect, there's a bunch of crossroads when you watch that fight. Vasily Jirov was an early client of Al Heyman, and at, at the time, people in the boxing world didn't know that much about Al Heyman. And this fight, especially the 10th, 11th, 12th round of that fight, right? And you're watching, and I'm listening to your commentary, um, and the 10th round, Zhirov is just getting beat up. He comes back in the 11th round, and you have this incredible, astonishing 12th round. And there's so much suspense in your commentary and when you're watching the fight, right? What's going to happen? And Zhirov, it seems like, and a lot of the, I think you thought and a lot of people thought maybe Zhirov is ahead on the cards. Maybe he just needs to hold and he can win this fight. Instead, he doesn't hold. He engages. He gets knocked down. Then the scores get read out. And it turns out that the 12th round didn't matter at all. And if Tony had stayed on his feet, he was going to win the fight regardless. And it was really kind of a crossroads moment for them. Tony goes on to fight and beat Evander Holyfield. And Giroff has a hard time finding his footing as a boxing star. I mean, this ends up being one of his great fights. He has this really strange encounter with Joe Messi at heavyweight where he loses the fight, but Messi gets injured, a subdural hematoma, I think. So, so it really was a kind of a crossroads moment for both of them. Giroff was one of the first figures in what became the wave of Eastern European post-Soviet fighters coming to the United States to try to make money in professional boxing. He was a precursor to the Klitschkos and Gennady Golovkin and Sergei Kovalev. Overall, in this um, ongoing process of Eastern European fighters trying to achieve audiences in the United States, has it gone surprisingly well? Is it still a troubled process uh, made more difficult by the exoticism of their names? Or do American audiences recognize their working class roots and tend to learn how to root for them? I mean, I think there had been in boxing, and there still is to some extent, an idea that fandom is going to be tribal. And that if you've got a guy from Mexico, the Mexicans are going to root for him. And if you have a black American fighter, the African American audience is going to root for him. And so with a guy like Vasily Jirov, OK, he's from Kazakhstan. A lot of Americans don't know that much about Kazakhstan. And there was a sense, if you read the, the contemporaneous press throughout his career, there's a sense that it's hard to market a guy from Kazakhstan. Ironic now that one of the biggest names in the sport is Gennady Golovkin, who's from Kazakhstan. And I think the person who changed that, or who did a lot to change that, was Manny Pacquiao. And part of what Pacquiao did was he got rid of the excuses. In other words, if this small guy from the Philippines can become a worldwide sensation and also an American sensation, then there's no reason anyone else from a, a different country can't do that. And I think there's an expectation that, yes, a fighter like Manny Pacquiao is very popular among Filipino Americans, but he's also popular among other folks as well. And so I think that maybe made it easier for fans, but maybe also easier for promoters to see you can get a guy from Russia, from Kazakhstan, from wherever, and if he's exciting to watch, people will tune in. Great observations. Welcome again to the show. Thank you. I look forward to many more conversations like this Thanks. in the future. And thank you for being with us on this edition of TFG Overtime.